Welcome to episode 49 of the Series About Security podcast for July 24th, 2013. Brought to you by the Center for Education and Research in Information Insurance and Security, or Sirius at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and today I'm just joined by Mike Hill. No Keith this week, or next week, or the week after, from what we've been told. Um, I don't. It wasn't because of last weekend. He, he didn't have bad feelings or no. anything about the whole argument. He just has stuff to do. <laughs> so uh, Mike has the first article for this week. So take it away, Mike. All right. Thanks, Preston. Um, so the article this week deals with the uh, the Apple developer website. Um, and just for clarification, when I say developer website, this is not the website where um, it's not the Apple's development server, but it's the server where developers log in uh, for doing app development. Um, this site has been offline since last Thursday. And uh, when you go to visit it, even as of today, what you get is a message from Apple. I'll go ahead and read it because it's pretty short here. It says, we'll be back soon. Last Thursday, an intruder attempted to secure personal information of our registered developers from our developer website. Sensitive personal information was encrypted and cannot be accessed. However, we have not been able to rule out the possibility that some developers' names, mailing addresses, and or email addresses may have been accessed. In the spirit of transparency, we want to inform you of the issue. We took the site down immediately on Thursday and have been working around the clock since then. They then go on to say, in order to prevent a security threat like this from happening again, we're completely overhauling our developer systems, updating our server software, and rebuilding our entire database. We apologize for the significant inconvenience that our downtime has caused you, and we expect to have the developer website up again soon. Um, and then they just go on to say, if your program membership was set to expire, they will extend it. And if you have any other concerns about your account, to contact them. To thank you for our patience. So that was Apple's official statement. Um, and then. Some articles have been coming out about this. Uh, an independent security researcher by the name of Ibrahim Balak claims that it was not hacked, that he was the one that reported the vulnerability to Apple and did not act with any malicious intentions. Um, what he did was he, um, he did extract that information as a proof of concept. Um, he then went to Twitter to make his case, and he even posted a video up on YouTube that uh, that showed, you know, that that scrolled through quickly, like all hundred thousand accounts have kind of been compromised in, in this breach. Um, he has since said that the video has been taken down. I don't know if he took it down or if YouTube said um, that it should be taken down. and apologized if any confidential information uh, was uh, sent out from it. It also acknowledges that he has reported security bugs to both. Uh, Facebook and Opera in the past, so it does appear he has a good track record for these things. Um, so a couple things concerned me about about this issue. Uh, one was a security researcher himself. I don't know why he would post the results of the attack to YouTube. Um, granted that you know when 100,000 names flash by in a few seconds, you can't get all that information, but you can get somebody's information. It, it seemed a bit irresponsible to do that. It also didn't seem necessary to do an attack, I'm sorry, I shouldn't call it an attack, but to do a research up to 100,000 usernames. It seems like you know, if you were to give an Apple a list of 200, it would have been sufficient to say, you're vulnerable, and here's a list of uh, folks I was able to get. Um, the other concerns I had with this was in Apple's response itself. They mentioned a couple things. Uh, they are updating their server software. Uh, reading between the lines there, it makes it sound like maybe their server software wasn't up to date. I don't know if that's just a bad grammar they used in, the, in their message, but it sounds like they need to do some updates to the server itself. So uh, maybe it wasn't up to date on patches. Maybe it wasn't running the latest version of the software. I'm not sure. We can't really tell from that statement. Uh, they also talked about uh, um, completely overhauling the system and rebuilding the entire database. So, you know, I know they're working quickly to get this taken care of. Obviously, the, the site has been down during all this time. It, it's hard to tell when it'll come back up. It sounds like um, they were very, very vulnerable in this situation. So, um, I thought it'd be a good one to talk about today. Yeah, I, I, well, I thought it was interesting, especially the stuff about uh, the security researcher, because it kind of leads to a question on if you're a security researcher 
and you report a problem to some company and they don't listen to you, what do you do? What do you do next? Right. Because you want them to fix it, especially if you use maybe he was a, maybe he's a developer himself. And he doesn't want his information leaked to hackers. You know, but he maybe needs to use be maybe his job depends on being a developer at the Apple in the Apple marketplace or whatever that's called the App Store. So I mean what do you do to a, if you they report a vulnerability to a company and they don't listen to you. Yeah, and I don't know the answer to that. Well, what I find interesting about it is, because um, I've got no reason to believe he's not telling the truth here. I mean, he posted the video, so he either figured out the exploit before the site was taken down, just happened to be someone else who noticed it, or what he's saying is true. He contacted Apple and said, you've got this vulnerability. What I find interesting is that Apple, um, you know, Wanting to be transparent and identify this, responded by you know saying you know an intruder you know they, they used language that kind of implied they were hacked and this was done you know they kind of use language that kind of implies that it was done maliciously instead of using language kind of like it was brought to our attention the site had been taken down um, it, it, you, with Apple's language it makes it, it makes it really sound like they feel like they're vulnerable like information was taken that can be out there and can be used whereas the security researcher makes it sound like no, it was me. I did, you know, I, I found this vulnerability. I reported it responsibly, and you know, Apple reacted by taking the site down. So, you know, it's kind of two different stories being told here. Well, if you report a vulnerability and you tell people how it's done, somebody else could have done it as well to right. get the information but, that he didn't post. On the but, but I think, but I think, in between that, the site was already taken down. I, I get the impression that when Apple was made aware that they took the site down. Um, or may, maybe they didn't take it down until he went on Twitter and said. Well, I think that, and I think that's what happened. I think Apple was. It sounded to me like Apple wasn't responsive to him saying, "Hey, look, you have a, this flaw," and, and they were like, "Well, we'll we'll look into it. You know, we'll look into it." And then it, it kept it stayed there and stayed there and stayed there, and eventually he was like, "Well, I'm going to tell the world about it." So you'll do something about it. Yeah. Well, according to him, Apple shut down the site four hours after he filed the last report to them. So that doesn't seem unreasonable to me, at least as far as taking it down, trying to stop anything from, um, you know, from from it continuing on. I mean, the the uh, companies like Apple in this scenario do have a responsibility to kind of check it out and investigate it. And that, that takes a little bit of time. So I, I don't know how much time passed from the first report to the last report he says the site was taken down four hours after the last report. To me what it sounds like is, um, what, what I read this, and again this is only the information we have here, is that the, sec the security researcher was upset that he did not get any acknowledgement. I think, you know, I think it's security researchers, they, we talked about this a little bit last week, they do a lot of work to find these vulnerabilities and report them. And I think a lot of it is, you know, if you're not doing it for money, you're doing it for something. Acknowledgement, respect, and I think he felt disrespected. You know, Apple said, "Hey, we've been, you know, we've had an intruder." I, I think they told the story like, "We've had an intruder. We've taken it down. We're being responsible." And he's saying, "Wait, wait, wait, wait! I'm the one who reported this. I did the responsible thing. Don't call me a hacker. I, I took the, you know, I, I took the responsible road. I disclosed it to Apple." And I think then, when he, he, the only thing I can see that is questionable to me is why he would put it up on YouTube. I don't know if it was. To save face for his own sake, you know, hey, I really did do this, and here's, you know, here's a video showing how I did it. You know, it really was me. That really wasn't done with malicious intentions. But just by doing that, I think he's fallen under a little scrutiny because my name's registered there, and I don't want it rolling along in some video right. on a public site. Well, and he also <laughs> potentially could face legal action and things like that from yeah. Apple, and maybe. That's what they were doing. It was like, well, we'll call it a hack so we can we can seek legal we can seek legal action to the person. If we just say somebody made us aware, then you know it, it, it could be. So um, they may just want to reserve their right to send whoever did it to jail. Yeah. So yeah, but you know, again, 
That's probably not the best road for Apple. It's take. not, but it's one that Apple they, they seems, can't choose to, to take. seems to choose to take uh, in, in certain situations until sometimes they've out of public pressure, but but Apple seems to have <coughs> still seems to have a kind of a adversarial role with with uh, security people sometimes. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I don't know, but clearly, I, I don't know. Apple also tends to be tight-lipped on things, so I don't know if they'll reveal exactly how the attack was done. You know, whether it was like a SQL injection vulnerability or cross-site scripting, what may have led to the vulnerability. Um, well, it seems like the security researcher would be your, uh, where you get that from. <laughs> well, I think he's now got incentive not to share it much more <laughs> because uh -huh. Apple's clearly made it obvious that they're not happy with with him reporting it, which is. Um, which is a bit unfortunate because you want to, I think you want security researchers, you want to be allies with them, you want them to report things to you. Um, you know, you want to have an open communication there. So, well, I think they're not happy about publicly disclosing a vulnerability that they hadn't, they didn't get a chance to fix. So yeah. <clears throat> I think that's their issue. And I, you know, in a way you can't really blame them. But, it does happen. I mean, if security researchers have a certain seem to have a certain tolerance on it, t it should take you this long to fix this yeah. issue. And if you don't fix it by in a certain amount of time, then I'm going to disclose it. And some of those disclosures come at you know security conferences like Black Hat, DEF CON, and yeah. things like that. Yeah. And these these high profile sites. And sometimes those uh, issues. A lot of times they work with the vendors. And they're usually fixed by the time they talk about them. Yeah. So you know, you hear about these, and it's like, wow, that was pretty significant. But by the time they talk about it, it's fixed. In some cases, it's not. But like a lot of times, they do ATM hacking and and other things that it's, it, it's infeasible to actually fix a lot of those issues in it quickly. So, but in this case, Apple probably did well. They, they Probably can fix it fairly quickly, but in the meantime, I guess the developer site's offline. Yeah, it is. It's so is this, is this like you can't? It's just essentially the revenue stream is gone. I mean, well, I think I mean, you can still buy stuff, right? I believe yeah. you can still buy stuff and everything. I think it's more of um, you know if you're trying to bring a new app online or update an existing app. I so think some of those avenues have been cut off. So no security first. updates to yeah. apps on the app store if there's a security problem. Yeah, um, which is interesting because we're going to talk about the security kind of with an app on the App Store <laughs> uh, in, in the next article. So, so yeah. yeah, so yeah, I think um, I, I I would hope that by the next podcast we do that Apple will have this fixed and uh, maybe we'll have a few more details. But uh, I I think it's it's in companies' best interest to work well with the security researchers because they have a you know, they have some leverage against you. <laughs> you know, they really do. And um, we don't know exactly what happened behind the scenes, how this was approached, and you know. Um, but I think it's always in the company's best interest to try to be friendly and, and keep those communication lines open because these people can always, you know, these researchers can always turn over. You know, we talked last week. They can turn it over. They, you know, they can sell the exploit. They can. Um, they can blast it on social media. There, there's a lot of things they can do to, to, to hurt your reputation. So, right. All right, well, let's uh, transition into my article. Um, this one's about uh, the Tumblr app on the iPhone and the iPad, which, relating to the last article, this, this was uh, fixed, and a, and, a, and a new version of the app was released on the App Store before the developer site went down. So um, you can, you can <laughs> if you have if you haven't updated your Tumblr uh, app on your iPad or your iPhone, you can do it. And uh, I'm pretty sure the new version on the App Store is has fixed this problem. But the problem with this app, and it's interesting that it's only for the iOS devices, is that the login for your user information um, for Tumblr was not sent over SSL. It was sent in clear text. And um, a, a security 
I won't say security researcher. I mean, I guess they were doing security research at the time, but a security person um, for a company was was testing the uh, apps from the uh, an iOS devices for his company to dis determine uh, which ones were essentially secure and which ones were not secure. And uh, he was using Wireshark to uh, essentially sniff the traffic that the, the app was sending um, and discovered that this the, the, the Tumblr app wasn't sending traffic over SSL, which he thought was odd. <laughs> and then, uh, after a significant amount of investigation and I think making sure that it wasn't because you were over the cellular network, you know, which the data in the, your cellular network is encrypted and things like that, um, and putting it over Wi-Fi and, and discovered that indeed that was an issue and uh, reported it to uh, to Tumblr and uh, I believe they they fixed it. Um, they released a quote very important security update for its iPhone and iPad app that fixes an issue that allowed passwords to be compromised in certain circumstances. Is what they said. <clears throat> so, and it urged users to change their passwords on Tumblr and anywhere else they use the same password. The other interesting thing about the uh, I think the release that that the Tumblr made was that they uh, encouraged people to use different passwords across different services by using an app like OnePass or LastPass. Yeah. They said that specifically in their release um, when they when they mentioned the update, which I think is good advice, and we've talked about it several times uh, on the podcast about using some sort of password management s s service to store passwords and use different passwords on different sites. And it's good advice, and I'm, I'm glad that they they have done that, and uh, I mean, I, I don't know how this oversight happened on their part. Well, I, I kind of, I, I have, I have some uh, theories on that, and um, what what I'm thinking is, you know, um, I iOS development is very different from Android and in Windows development. Um, so I mean, really, at a minimum, you have at least two different versions of the code. You know, your iOS code set and your Android code set, which could be a t completely different set of developers for, for starters. I mean, it really could be two entirely different teams working on it. Um, the other thing is, a lot of times, you know, even if it is the same developers, a lot of times you'll develop uh, one app first. Let's say they did the iOS app first, then they go and they do the Android app, and then maybe the Windows app. Um, so there's opportunities for you know, uh, SSL really kind of, I mean, one, it, it's a huge oversight. It never should have been not over SSL, at least username and password. I mean, that should have always been over a secure connection. Um, so that really was just an oversight from, from the start. Um, but I think FireSeed, you know, released a few years ago, really made it so sites wanted to go to kind of like all SSL. Um, and I could see where maybe when the iOS app was being developed. Again, this is all theory. I have no idea what the timelines were. But maybe at the time, you know, before that was released, people weren't as aware and they're like, oh well, you know, once they're logged in, all the traffic can just be over HTTP. And you know, they just never went back and made sure that that initial connection with the username and password um, were over SSL. So I think that's um, I think that's a likely that's a possible scenario. Now the thing I thought was interesting is kind of going back to our previous article was, um, it said um, the, the source who wants to remain anonymous had said that he notified Tumblr two weeks prior and that he uh, was not getting any response from them. And many took it to the, to the press. So again, you know, this is another example of um, companies that really need to listen to these folks who report vulnerabilities. To me, this was a this was a big one. The Tumblr should have been all over it from the start. You know, their their release, you know, their statement, you know, indicates that they immediately released an update. They take these incidents very really seriously. Uh, <coughs> they don't touch on the fact that they were aware of it two weeks prior. That's true. The register yeah. about the story. And the other thing that I found interesting in the article was that other sites that do have, that that tell you if an app is secure, safe, and or not gave the Tumblr app a clean bill, a bill essentially, 
and they said it was it was a good it was a good app, you know. Yeah. Where you're like, well, obviously they didn't fully test it or vet it or whatever to make sure everything was was okay with it. They probably just was like, we're like, well, it's Tumblr and they're good. They're good, so we'll just try to save. I don't know. I don't know where yeah. they just used the permissions that the app uh, essentially used to make sure it wasn't doing anything bad. Yeah. So, so I, I don't know how. I don't know. I don't know much about that. So I don't typically look at those sites. So, <laughs> well, you know, there's a couple of things users can do. Obviously, they can update the app, and that's the strongest recommendation is to update the app. Fortunately, they were able to get that update in before Apple suffered their issue. Um, but you know, part of this too is you know, uh, if you're over your 3G, 4G network, you know, you're really not at risk. You know, if you're using an open Wi-Fi in a coffee shop, you really need to think about everything you're doing anyway on your device. You always kind of need to be a little, a little careful on that. And the other thing is, uh, as we've talked about many times, you know, using a password tool or a password safe that allows you to use unique passwords for every site you visit. Um, that's the, to me, that's the biggest fallout is, um, you know, if someone's sniffing passwords and they get you using a password, it's probably not so much what they can do on Tumblr. But if you're using that same username and password on Facebook, Twitter, your email for your banking site, now they can get into a lot of other sites, and that information is a lot more valuable. I believe in the case of Tumblr, they use email addresses for your username, which is pretty common. Which is pretty common, yeah. So, so they could get your, like, Amazon. Yeah, let's say you might use email addresses and, and a lot of other places. So if you use your same, the same password on all these sites, then suddenly, your all those accounts are exposed. Yeah, and I think that's the hardest thing to kind of get across is it's not just Tumblr. You might be like, I don't care about Tumblr. I don't do much on there. You know, it's just something for fun. It's like, well, okay, you know. But if you're using that same username and password in other places, uh, hackers are going to try that combination. I mean, that's the that's why they go after all these places. They they go after these large repositories of usernames and passwords so they can turn around and apply them to other sites and right. see which ones they can unlock. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, if you're using it over Wi-Fi, then you know it's HTTPS is there for a reason, right? <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, that, that was a glaring error, and, and I hope that the, the site, uh, I haven't seen it where it rates the app security. I hope they'll take this into account. Maybe they can run that, add that to their unit test and say, you know what, we should try logging in and, and, and seeing that these apps use SSL. I mean, that's a pretty big glaring hole. If, if you're not using SSL on the login, you need to add it immediately. All right. That's uh, not something you want to do. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I wonder how, the, I honestly wonder how that fell through the cracks. I, I would have thought they would have tested something as important as that. Just make yeah. sure that your traffic is being passed over as well. Yeah, and I, you know, we haven't heard otherwise. You know, I wonder if, you know, it is one of those things where maybe in a particular version it was turned off. You know, it used to be there and someone turned it off while doing some small test and then, you know, incidentally checked it in, checked that into the production code base. I mean, those scenarios can't happen. You know, you're testing something, uh, you've got some certificate issues or whatever, and you're like, you know what, I'm just going to tr turn this off for now. Yeah, you know, so I, mean, I can see the traffic and see what's I can going see, on. I can now. see what's going on, and I'll turn it back on when I'm done. And, I mean, these things can happen. I, I mean, it's pretty disheartening if it's been there all along. Right. Which is kind of what the article implies. But that's what that's why you have uh, that's why you have various testings in the software yeah. development life cycle so that you can find glaring errors like that. And obviously they didn't have a test for this particular scenario there and this has been a problem for who knows how long. Yeah, yeah. It's it, it's not good. Uh, it's it's a good thing they, they patched it, but um, Obviously, those users should change their passwords and should make sure those passwords are not being used anywhere else. Yes, and update your Tumblr. And update your Tumblr. <laughs> if you haven't right. done so well, already. iOS. <laughs> uh, and change your password and change your and use LastPass or OnePass or some other yeah. password. I think I said this last week. Yes. Too. So that can be our closing message. Yeah. Yeah. You use a password tool or, or password safe. I'll throw mine in there as well. So I am beginning to use LastPass more often. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, any anything else? Nope.
does All right. Well, I'm Preston Wiley. Thanks to Mike Hill. Uh, Keith Watson will not be back next week. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we can uh, set up a little yeah. imaginary chair. Oh. All right. Well, thanks for listening, and have a safe and secure day.